impatient optimists. That's how the Gates Foundation, the Bill and the Melinda Gates Foundation wants to call themselves. They are working towards eradication of some of the deadliest diseases and they have made certain progress. The agency, the organization, which is the largest philanthropic organization with endowments of over $43.5 billion, is working towards eradicating some of these diseases, eradicating poverty, and looking at achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030, and is helping some of the other organizations around the world, as well as countries, to help them achieve those goals. I have with me Mr. Mark Suzman, who's the global head of strategy, as well as the global head of policy advocacy for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mr. Suzman, first of all, thank you so much for sparing time for CNBC TV 18. Pleasure to have you here. We've recently seen and read the goalkeepers report that was released at the uh, UN Assembly. Uh, last year versus this year. What has been the development? Because last year, the goalkeeper's report, as well as some of the statement, uh, statements by the Gates Foundation, said that we may not be able to achieve the 2030 targets. Are we more optimistic now? Uh, well, you started the conversation by saying at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we like to call ourselves impatient optimists. So yes, we remain optimistic that the world can meet those very ambitious goals. Whether we do so or not does depend in large part on India. Mm. Uh, but that said, we are also very concerned that uh, attention is lagging in some key areas, whether we're talking about poverty, whether we're talking about health, whether we're talking about agricultural productivity. The bottom line of the message in the report is that if we don't take more aggressive, urgent action now, we really won't meet those ambitious targets, and that means many, many hundreds of millions of lives will not be improved as they could and should be. In the current scenario when the global trade is not at its best, when the global economy is not at its best, what's the threat? Do you see uh, countries and governments now looking less towards donations and philanthropy and the focus shifting back on discussions around economy? Yes, yeah, so we'll two answer that. First, it's clear and, and one of the messages in our goalkeepers report is that the primary responsibility and the difference between success and failure in meeting these goals actually is what countries do themselves. Even among the very poorest countries and certainly among middle income countries that are now very large economies like India. Mm -hmm. There's no question international aid and support can only at best be a marginal support. But philanthropic capital like ours can do things, can test models, riskier interventions, pilot projects, other areas that might help encourage or provide examples for government or other actors to follow. At the same time, international aid remains critically important in key areas, particularly in health, but also in agriculture, uh, also in sanitation, and particularly for very poor countries like many of the poorest countries that are in sub-Saharan Africa. There we are seeing a growing challenge where many traditional rich countries that have been donors are having active debates about whether they should pull back are these resources still worth spending? Shouldn't they be spending more at home? Mm. And that we do regard as a worry because arguably this is the moment where those interventions are at their most successful. We are saving more lives through vaccines, through antiretroviral treatments for people with HIV AIDS, providing more opportunities in areas like agriculture than we ever have before. So it's not a time we want people to step back. We want both rich countries and poor countries and those emerging middle income giants like India all to play their part. But you know, with, with trade wars, you know, in the last one or two years taking the center stage as far as international cooperation is concerned, is there a threat as far as cooperation on cert these important issues is concerned? Well, there's a threat in terms of how big a priority it is seen. Because really, from our perspective, the Sustainable Development Goals, which were endorsed by every single country on the planet mm. in 2015, and they are an accountability metric for every government to their own people about what they're going to do. They are in some ways the ultimate global solidarity set of goals. They're interlinked. We cannot meet the goals in the individual countries unless we are thinking about the global efforts that, that link those together. And so while obviously we don't work in these areas like global trade or security or other issues, mm -hmm. to the extent that debates or frictions there might lead to distractions or less of a focus on these broader global solidarity interventions, that would be a matter for concern. Mm. At the same time, perhaps we hope that by uh, 
putting more of a focus on collective goals like this. We think that anybody, wherever they live, whatever political party they are part of, whatever country they're in, surely can come together and agree that helping alleviate extreme poverty, helping reduce preventable child deaths, these are things that nobody can be against. But, you know, you speak about the governments investing themselves, and that has to be the larger part as far as working towards these goals is concerned. Is that happening now as far as, you know, investing in the intangibles is concerned versus investing in the tangible assets like infrastructure? Well, there's a very interesting discussion that uh, we are being part of at the moment about how and where do governments prioritize investments in what we call human capital. Mm that it's easy to point to the investments in the roads, the electricity, the infrastructure. Those are all critical for economic growth. But in the end, any country is its people. And the core components of investing in people are really health and education. So we believe strongly, and one of the messages of the Goalkeepers Report and a lot of the work we do, is you need to combine those events. And that is what is actually going to drive the long term. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes challenging for politicians because politicians often operate more in terms of electoral cycles and these are long-term investments over 5, 10, 15, 20 years mm. because you're investing in the people who are going to be growing up now. They will be the voters of the future, they will be the workers of the future. Mm. Uh, so we're always trying to do. There, there are important improvements in how governments are making these investments absolutely we think more can be done. How has been the relationship with the Indian government in the light of what you just spoke about, investing in the intangibles, investing in healthcare, investing in nutrition, in education? Do you think the government is making the right amount of investments and the right quality of investments in India? Uh, well, let me take that answer in two parts. So the first is in terms of are you prioritizing these issues? Is there a perceived strong political priority? And there Actually, it's been very encouraging to see this government, whether it's from the Swatch Bharat mission on sanitation, whether it's the national nutrition mission, uh, whether there is the new uh, national health ins insurance scheme, hmm. uh, that there are strong, tangible commitments to making these necessary investments. Hmm. What is still a challenge, but this is not a challenge unique to India, these things are difficult and complex to implement. Uh, you can have a policy, but how do you put them in place? Do you ensure that efficient resources are going there? How do you ensure that some of the state level models are being shared and replicated? And that is something that I think India has made great strides in the last few years, but certainly we believe more should be done. You know, when you say more needs to be done, I uh, would want to understand whether it is from the quantum perspective or whether it is from the quality perspective. Where do you think is the bigger challenge in India? Well, there is an aggregate issue, which is, you know, as a proportion of national GDP, India does spend proportionately less than most equivalent countries on health. And so when we talk about the investments, it is both we would like to see more resources coming in aggregate around these issues because we think there are strong investments, but that's around the whole infrastructure. There's direct health, there is the nutrition, mm -hmm. there is the sanitation, there are these sort of basic building blocks. Mm -hmm. But then there is the quality of implementation. Uh, that is, again, something, this is not a challenge unique to India. Everyone struggles. The United States struggles in how to be effective health care. Mm -hmm. In fact, arguably, the United States is in some ways very ineffective in some of the ways it channels uh, health care given the amount it spends and the outcomes it has. Mm -hmm. And so these are just common problems that we're trying to address. And here when you still have very dense you know, rural populations, uh, how you think about the critical role of primary health care in particular mm -hmm. and how it links into these wider interventions is an area that you know, we're constantly working on. And this is something we work on at the state level in states like UP and Bihar as well as working with the National Health Ministry. Mm -hmm. How do you look at the Ayushman Bharat, the large-scale uh, insurance scheme, the health insurance scheme that the government has launched in India, and how does the Gates Foundation work somewhere, you know, fit in with the entire new insurance network that the government is trying to create? Yeah. So overall, we think it's a very encouraging step forward, that, you know, it has key attributes that we think are critically important that we can, we believe will really help advance health care. It's creating a national ICT backbone that's going to be able to sort of track patient records and movements and other issues like that. We're creating an independent or uh, national health agency which is going to be able to look and address these kind of issues directly. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole model of actually providing emergency resources to very poor people who otherwise won't have them will help preserve a lot of people from health shocks that they once had that might have thrown them back into poverty. 
And so these are all critical steps which we think are very important. We're at the very early stages of this. Right. Again, the, you know, the challenge and uh, opportunity is in the implementation. How do we roll it out? How do we learn? Some states are likely going to be having more effective implementation than others. How do you transfer that knowledge? That's something, again, that for when you talk about the Gates Foundation, we're constantly trying to do and help. Where are some of the best practices and ideas for implementation? You know, what technical support can we provide to the government? Now it is taking this important leadership role. Uh, and so those are discussions we're actively underway.